Hi, fifth graders. It's Miss Rayborn here. I am excited to have this conversation with you about artists who use the artwork that they make to make a statement about things that are important to them, things that are happening in the world, and things that they would like to see change. Because one of the things we know is that artwork is extremely powerful and it brings up emotions in the people who make it and the people who look at it. So today we're going to look at four different artists and each of them kind of makes artwork for a different reason. So let's start with Mariah Reading. So oh, I hate that you can't see her name. Let me see if I can move myself. Oh, there. So uh, Mariah Reading is an American artist. She's a living artist. She's making artwork right now um, out in the world. And she is extremely worried about our planet and how we're treating it and what's going to happen. She's always been a very outdoorsy person. Um, I actually got to meet her a couple of years ago. She was a speaker at a conference that Miss Rayborn was at. And I got to spend a little bit of time with her and really discuss her artwork, how she started making it and why she makes it. What she told me was that she's a pretty outdoorsy person. She goes on lots of hikes and things like that. And when she was out, she started carrying with her um, a bag, which is something actually Miss Rayborn does too. I have a little mesh bag that I carry with me when I go on a little hike. And if I see something, I pick it up and add it into my bag. And when I get home, a lot of it goes into the recycle. Some of it is just trash. But as long as I'm out on my walk or my hike with my dogs, I can pick up things along the way. So she, as an artist, said she really wanted to start um, working those pieces of artwork into something that would draw attention to the fact that they were someplace that they did not belong, that they shouldn't be, right? So she picks up the pieces of trash and then she photographs the space where she is before she leaves. And she goes home or in some cases, she paints it right there in the spot. Um, she evidently does a lot of camping where she might be on a camping trip for weeks at a time. And so sometimes she said she'll even just set up her tent right there where she picked up the object and she'll do the painting right there. After the painting is finished, as you can see, she holds it up into the um, environment and you can see that it looks as if it's just extending right across and on to there, right? Because she's trying to capture the place where she found it on the object itself. So let's look at another one. Here's another water bottle that she found um, on a trip where she was doing some hiking. And you can see that the water bottle just extends perfectly sort of into what you imagine that skyline might look like with the mountain. And even to me, I'm so impressed with the details of this tree right here and how it continues onto the bottle. And look at this branch. This is amazing to me. Watch the branch. It goes all the way down and right onto the bottle. So she said she does her very best to photograph these at the same time of day as she took the original picture, because as you can imagine, the time of day would really affect how the colors might change. Also here you can see the clouds don't perfectly match up, but you couldn't possibly paint something quick enough for the clouds to be the same. She does not impose these on top of an image she's already taken. After she takes the after she paints them, she holds them up herself and then retakes the pictures. This is not something that is happening with Photoshop. People have asked me that before. She has also told me that she leaves her hand in there in the picture on purpose, that she wants that to be a sort of a statement about man's or woman's effect on the environment around her, that she found this flip-flop, right, just out in the middle of nowhere, probably fell out of somebody's backpack. They didn't even realize it was missing for quite some time, I would guess. Okay, so that's Mariah Reading, and she is extremely interested in environmental activism, and this is one of the ways that she draws attention to a cause that she really cares about. So let's look at our next artist. Our next artist is a graffiti artist, and his name is Banksy. And I actually, I just said his, but I don't know that. Banksy's identity is a secret because um, graffiti art is illegal right? We know that painting on buildings and walls, you are not allowed to do unless you have permission. We're going to talk about somebody who is a muralist, which is someone that has permission to paint on the outsides. However, Banksy um, just puts it up in the middle of the night. It has been sort of um, people 
kind of guess at who they think Banksy might be. There are actually a large group of people who think that Banksy is not one person, that maybe Banksy is a collaboration of quite a few artists who all use the same name and the same tag as to confuse people. One of the things that's really interesting about Banksy is Banksy really has a lot to say about social awareness and what's happening in our lives around us and how we treat the people that in our communities and what we do about it. So normally we would be having a really awesome conversation in class, but since we're doing a video because of the way you're doing exhibition this year, um, I just, I hope you've taken a minute to kind of take a chance take a look at this. So it's down low to the ground. It's not high up on the wall. It's down low because I think the intention is for it to look like this man is sitting down on the ground, right? He has a sign and it says, keep your coins. I want change. So Miss Rayborn grew up in San Francisco and San Francisco has um, a really large homeless population. And I grew up seeing front people like this who are on the street, just trying to make a change in their life and wanting something better for themselves. And I think his sign, the way it's worded, I always have my class have a good talk about this, whether they think that's intentional, keep your coins, I want change. So I think what he's asking for is not a few nickels and dimes that you might have spare in your pocket. He's asking for help because he doesn't want just a little bit of money, a few coins. He really wants to change his life so that he can be a productive member of society. And he probably needs some help to get that done. So there's one example of Banksy. Another example of Banksy is this one here. We recently actually, in the last year or so, have had several examples in the United States of um, riots and uprisings and protests that have happened here in our country. Sometimes the people um, make an effort to cover their face and their identity, and sometimes they're open about it. This particular one, I think, is really inspiring to look at because it's clear that this person is trying to mask their identity, and they're pulling back as if they're getting ready to throw something right? Now, in a really violent protest, someone might be throwing something um, that might hurt someone. And what is he holding in his hand? A bouquet of flowers. And it's the only color in the entire artwork that I see. It's black and white except for those flowers. So Banksy is notorious for not putting any meaning behind any of the artworks that he puts up. I can tell you that this artwork first appeared in a neighborhood in London, which was having a lot of controversy uh, amongst the neighborhood and the people who lived there because they were from um, different sides of uh, the fence of a different country, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. And um, I think when I look at this, that maybe what Banksy is um, sort of alluding to is the idea that if maybe if we could throw kindness around the same way that we throw harsh words and weapons and violence, maybe as a community, we could work together and get to know each other a little bit better. That maybe what these difficult conversations need is not um, more violence or more weapons or more harsh or angry words. Maybe what it needs is a little bit of empathy and a little bit of kindness. So this is Banksy. And like I said, Banksy is a graffiti artist. We have no idea who Banksy is. Could be more than one person. And these often pop up in the middle of the night and also all over the world. Banksy's artwork is so famous now that it now sells for hundreds of thousands and even actually millions of dollars. Um, so this this artist or group of artists were unsure. It has become quite famous, but really the big impact is that they are getting people to really talk about what's happening in their cultures and in their communities. So this artist, Shepard Berry, also an American artist who is working and living right now in the United States, um, is a muralist and a printmaker. So these uh, prints that are here, Shepard Ferry is, uh, um, I would guess he's in his 40s, I would guess by now. Um, he is naturally a printmaker. So um, you've done a little bit of printmaking over time. It's kind of like making a stamp. And one of the things that he does is that he definitely lends himself to political causes fairly often. About 10 years ago, 12 years ago, he made the Hope poster for the Obama campaign when um, then... Senator Obama was running 
to be president. This piece of work and what we're going to look at next is actually centered around the idea of women's suffrage and women um, being a, a big part of a community. I'm going to see if I can move myself and how important they are there to their community and also that they have equal rights. So you may be recognizing this particular mural. Now, the difference between a mural and graffiti is that a mural is painted on the wall with the permission of um, not only the owner of the building, but also most of the time it is paid for or commissioned by a group of people. This mural was painted last spring um, and Miss Rayborn actually got to participate a little tiny bit in the making of this mural, which makes me feel really, really, really proud. And it is on the side of a hotel that is in downtown Austin. And it was painted and commissioned for the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. It's only been 100 years, actually this year, was the 100th year that women have been allowed to vote in the United States. So about 100 years ago, women were not allowed to vote, which just seems crazy to me. So you can see that he's compiled here together images of Wonder Women, and he has images of, that are meant to allude to different races of women and different, different ethnicities. He has words and patterns in here that are sort of spliced together to create this really interesting kind of dynamic. And he's included symbols and words to really um, make it clear what his stance is on how important it is that women's suffrage be protected, which I think is really interesting. So Shepard Berry is a muralist. He has permission and also gets paid uh, quite a lot of money to paint these beautiful murals. And I hope that if you have time, you will go and see one of these murals, uh, this mural, pardon me, downtown. The last artist that we're going to talk about today, I'm actually going to let him do some talking for himself because this artist, I'm going to scooch myself as much as I can off the screen. This artist um, created an artwork. He's a photographer. His name is JR. And he created an artwork in an area of the world that was experiencing a lot of conflict. And I'm going to let him explain to you and then we're going to look at it together. So this project is called Face to Face, and Face to Face was the first time I traveled outside of France, really, uh, for, an art, for an art project. And at that time, I remember I was spending a lot of time in the projects of Paris doing portraits of a generation and all those face things, and talking with the youth and my friends and the people there. Middle East was always a you know, place we talk about, even if none of us had ever went there, everyone had an opinion. And I was like, well, you know, I have a French passport. I can just go there. And as a French, I can actually go on either side. And it's something that the locals can't do. So I went there with my friend Marco. And we just, you know, started walking around and realized, okay, how can we do a project here uh, that could work on each side? And the idea of the project is really simple. It's to put people face to face, but people that have that do the same job. Because when we got there, uh, I remember arriving in Palestine and getting in a taxi. And I had heard so many stories and things and friends texting me, good luck, you know, I hope you survive. And, and then I went there and the taxi guy is just the nicest guy ever and just takes me around. And suddenly, slowly, as much as, as I meet people, my stereotypes keep falling. And the taxi driver asked me, oh, what are you here for? I say, I'm an artist. And I say, oh, okay, that's great. And what's your project? And then, I, you know, I would say, well, I want to take photos of people doing the same job. And I would photograph you, for example. Oh, sure, yeah, take my photo. Uh, what are you going to do with it? I say, oh, I'm going to, you know, paste it big. Uh, like, big like how? I say, you know, big like this building. So people at the time didn't really believe me. But they still let me take their portraits. And I made them sign a waiver. I know I told the, the driver, actually, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to also photograph a taxi from the other side. He said, oh, you know, I let you take my photo. But on the other side, they'll never let you take the photo. And they'll be the, the meanest people. I, I would not go there if I was you. And so I would always go on the other side with all I've heard from the other side. And then it would be, I would be hearing the exact same thing on the other side. So when I meet a taxi driver in Israel and I would tell him the project, he would be as nice and let me take his photos and sign the waiver. And then he would say, oh, but don't try to do it on the other side. They would never let you take the portrait. 
and I kept having the same conversation on each side. So I photographed, you know, hairdresser, uh, uh, students, uh, uh, you know, like uh, sculptors, artists, sports people, like guards, police, and everybody that I could find the exact same person on the other side. And I came back to France, printed the photo, and then we went back there with a couple of friends. And interestingly, I thought it would be impossible because you're like, you can't paste someone playing their own caricature on how the other one sees them because they kept seeing the worst of each other through the media. So you would think they would never let you paste in the middle of Ramallah in Palestine the portrait of an Israeli in the middle of the city. And interestingly, we would ask, excuse me, sir, can we paste on that wall? And the person would be, oh, what is it? Uh, oh, no, I'm just an artist and I, I did this project and it's black and white images. I'm going to paste them here. But why are you doing this? No, I mean, there's no particular reason. I'm, you know, I, I just want to show the similarity between people and, uh, and raise questions. And they can say, oh, well, if it could help, you know, sure, take my work. So then I would start pasting while my friend and Marco would have like a little booklet with all the other portraits. And very quickly, because people have never seen an installation like that, people start, you know, stop in the street. And like very quickly, you have a big group of people looking at you. And um, the more people look, then one guy, of course, is going to ask the question, excuse me, who, is, who, is those, who are those people? And I say, oh, you know, I'm... You know, it's, it's photos I took. Oh, okay, good, good for you. But, who, you know, who are those people? Oh, they're two taxi drivers. Oh, okay, okay. But why two taxi drivers? And I would say, well, because one is Israeli and one is Palestinian. And you should see the look on their face. People would look at it. And I could see. So JR is starting to describe how people would be very confused about why he would do that. And I want us to look at a piece of that artwork. And, oh, pardon me, I might need to go back. I went over it too quickly. So what he discovered is that he would explain to people that one was from one side, from Palestine, and one was from Israel. Israel and Palestine have been in a war for quite some time, um, a conflict, you could say. And it centers around their religion and their faith choices and who they believe has um, real access and really belongs and should live in that land because they both think of it as their homeland. And they both think that um, it is their their religion and their faith's natural homeland. So you can understand how that would feel very important and it would bring up a lot of conflict. So what's happened over time is that Israelis have been told and convinced that Palestinians are terrible, awful people. And Palestinians have been told and been raised to believe that the Israelis are terrible, awful people. And you heard him explain that he went there and he had just the most wonderful and genuine time with kind people from both sides. And so when he pasted up their pictures of the two of them, or three of them all together, I'm going to show you what the wall looks like. Oh, Sorry, I accidentally hit the wrong one. So this is one side of the wall. So you can imagine on the other side, exactly the same images, okay? And what he did was ask people to try to identify which person was the Israeli person and which one was the Palestinian person. And people, he said, often would say, oh, of course I know who it is. I know who, or I recognize my brother, or I recognize my friend. And they would point to the person who was actually from the opposite side because we, of course, cannot see things like that on people's faces. And what it did was it started to start a conversation about um, these two groups of people working together and really seeing each other, not as um, oppositional you know, people over there, but just another person and really develop some empathy for the situations that they might be having, which I think is just a really incredible conversation. Okay, so our last couple of things that are here, there is a video here about Picasso's Guernica, and there is a video about a, a plastic installation about the plastic that is in um, our oceans. I am linking 
this information at the bottom of the slide. If you would like to go and watch those, you absolutely can. But I don't want to take all of your time up. I know we've looked at a few examples here, and I hope you've gotten inspired. I cannot wait to see the things that you create. I am so proud of you guys and the amazing people that you're growing into. Miss Rayborn has watched you since you were teeny tiny, since you were five years old in kindergarten. And I'm so proud of the people that you are becoming, the risk-taking, caring, full of empathy people that you are becoming. So I'm so excited to see how you approach exhibition, what you decide to tackle, and how you're going to draw attention to a cause that matters to you. Now, Ms. Rayborn's email address is exactly the same. So if you have a question or a share and you want to reach out to me via email, even over at my new school, I would love to see and hear what you're working on. So bye for now. Ooh, wrong side. And I can't wait to see what you're working on. Good luck and let me know if you need my help.